Our next and uh, last speaker for today was born in Belfast. He studied Irish nationalist movement at Edinburgh University. You can ask him about the correlation later. He has worked as a history teacher in a state school in England and then moved on to museums and did a lot of things in education in museums. He was responsible for learning at Brighton Museum and the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, but you might know him more from being responsible for education at the V&A in London. He has written children's books and a national report that some of you, I guess, have read, bits and pieces or the whole of, uh, A Commonwealth about learning and museums. While he worked for V&A, he also led the development of Sackler Center for Arts Education and uh, created and became the co-director of the exhibition Road Cultural Group, which is actually the museum-y part of the city where you all, we all have visited. And now he is the director of the Amagadva, not perfect, but at least I tried, Cymru, which is the National Museum of Wales and president of the UK Museum Association. David Anderson, welcome. I should start by saying that I'm not sure I believe in museums. The Commonwealth Report was written in part because of a, a lack of faith, a loss of faith. And it was my journey to believe in museums again. And some recent events in the UK, and I'll take the Scottish um, independence vote in a minute as an example, have made me once more question whether museums are really doing the job they should. If I speak very little about learning, I hope you'll forgive me. That doesn't mean I don't think that what I speak about has no relevance to learning. I'll show some images very quickly in a minute, just so that I hope you get some sense of Wales, unculture in Wales, uh, well, museum culture anyway, because it is a context for what I say. But I will do it quickly as images. There won't be much of anything in the way of text. But I wanted to, s to start by misquoting um, a Roman writer whose name I don't even have with me now, but it occurred to me last night that I loved the quote and therefore want to use it. This is not word for word accurate, but once we lived in an age of gold, then we lived in an age of silver, now we live in an age of rust. Museums are and must be culturally located in time and place. We've talked a bit about the importance of content, how important is it? Um, Neil Postman, in a speech I still remember from 25 years ago, at the ICOM conference, 1989, The Hague, asked a question. Supposing that you were in Germany of 1933 and you had no reason to fear for your own life, what kind of museum would you create? The museum that was most expected of you or the one that that society needed? And I think that question stands year by year in every nation. What culture is important for us here now? What way of learning is important for us here and now? I will now show very quickly, I hope, um, some of these images as context. If I don't speak to them, I hope you're just left with visual impressions in a way. And perhaps I should explain that I'll begin by showing images of each of the eight sites as part of the National Museum Wales that will just be titles, really, but to give you a sense of the diversity and also the strength of the industrial heritage in Wales. And then I'll show some images of plans for redevelopment of St. Fagan's Museum 
to change it from an open-air museum, essentially inspired by Skansen, into a national museum of history for an emerging nation that is still coming to terms with its place in the world, still coming to terms with its own history, and for whom perhaps museums are a more important resource than they may be perceived to be in some other places. And yeah, there you get the, the sites. This is the new development, the major project we're undertaking. The site, large landscape with buildings collected from all over Wales, relocated, as well as a main building which um, has some small exhibition space. A workman's institute very emotive symbol in Wales of self-education, funded penny by penny by miners and other industrial workers usually, uh, in order to create places for libraries, social activities, and learning in the broader sense of the word. A medieval church restored. I've just given two or three samples of buildings that, of the 40 or so on the site. The journey that the museum is trying to make. Co-production and collaboration with the public is fundamental to the whole working process for developing the new museum. 200 community groups and organizations, drugs charities and others, um, have been and are involved in the decisions about the content the methodologies, the whole way in which the museum is developing. This will be a co-production museum in development at opening and f I hope forever after that as well. Um, new extension to be built with new exhibition spaces. The idea of multiple voices. Ways of life, of course perhaps closer to the current museum. Learning spaces. A new building, which to my surprise links with a lot of what has been said already, because Igwethti in Welsh means um, the workshop, and it is a place of stretching back into the past to see the ways in which people made in order to survive for leisure, for all sorts of purposes. Um, and also, new for this site anyway, archaeological excavations elsewhere in Wales have led to the discovery of um, evidence of the original, one of the original palaces of the Princes of Gwynedd from the 13th century. And through experimental archaeology will be reconstructed. And then an Iron Age um, huts, houses really, which also are being reconstructed with as much authenticity of technique as possible. But both those two projects are being developed through apprenticeship with volunteers, with school children as volunteers, um, collaboration, co-production, um, making. And underneath this is the concept of the hand, the head and the heart, all three. So, thank you. In Britain, culture still far too much comes from London. Despite devolution, Wales has control over some processes, the education system, the health system. It has no control over how much money it gets from the central um, funding from taxes, etc. That's decided by London. It has no control over social policy for the most part, welfare, um, if you like, the terms, the really key things for people's lives 
in terms of wealth and poverty. Um, our society is still dominated by Oxford and Cambridge universities, by the public schools, and it's getting worse, not better. All the evidence shows that. The great dominant of the leading figures in law, journalism, and politics went to private school and went to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, my daughter Rosie, um, who had a perfectly respectable degree from another university, when she asked about applying to work for one of the national newspapers, she was a trainee journalist, was told if you didn't go to Oxbridge, there's no point in applying. We only choose the best. Um, the crash of 2008 revealed that, first of all, there is an ideology of austerity, that money must be taken away from public services, we cannot afford it. But it also revealed that there is one public service which must at all costs be protected. Banking. Wales was colonized in the 13th century. That palace that you saw there, the Great Hall from um, Clisrossia, that will be reconstructed, was the last manifestation of independence as a state or as proto-state by the Welsh before the English conquest. Yet still the Welsh language has survived and is spoken by a quarter to a third of the population. Um, an amazing achievement that eight, 800 years or so of conquest and colonization has still not suppressed the, the language. It's a world of literature, song, music, and thought embedded in culture that I had little idea of before I went to Wales. I will admit that freely. Um, and I think probably is completely closed to most people in the United Kingdom because culture comes from London, it's English language, and it is a thought system which is still being applied ruthlessly by the BBC and the central media. And Wales is England's first and last colony. Very little Welsh history is still taught in schools, even though for the last decade or so the Welsh government has had control over the curriculum. That's because of, in part, the, the, the investment that's needed in order to reconstruct what is essentially still an English system. It's too slow, and I won't make excuses for that. Scotland has a greater degree of confidence, a greater degree of, um, of uh, separation, really, in, in, um, in all sorts of ways. But if you look at both Scotland and Wales, the industries were destroyed by the English government in the 1980s, the steel and coal industries. That was a political act. I don't think that can be debated. Um, we now have third generations unemployed across the north of England, of course, as well as Scotland and Wales in large in post-industrial areas. Um, the root traditional self-education in the process of this has in part been broken, too. That Miners Institute you see there was rescued by the museum because it was derelict and about to be knocked down after the 80s. Um, we have in Wales the highest levels of child poverty in the United Kingdom, and that's bad enough. We have the highest levels of child suicide, we have the greatest child obesity problem, and we have huge youth unemployment problems. The separation of wealth and poverty is growing exponentially in Britain. Um, again, under the mantra of austerity, um, we have made whole sections of the population ill, mentally, physically, in order that we may be rich. In the process, like Saturn, we're devouring our own children. Our children are the new poor. Wales is developing strategies for working through culture in order to address the consequences of poverty. Um, it's a five-year ambition. It's just the beginning, and it will have to, have to be based on the best research available if it is to be effective. And this, we as speakers talked a little bit about that last night. And that will be a major challenge. The Scottish referendum has changed everything, I hope. Um, I would recommend, if you're interested at all in these issues, and I think it's not just an issue of Scotland and England, Scotland and the United Kingdom, this is, a, this is a, an issue of the nature of democracy that it has raised. If you'd like to read about, about that in a not terribly long, but I think very, very powerful article, look at the Guardian newspaper uh, last Saturday, which, again, I have to say, had a, came out against Scottish independence. But Irvin Welsh, in last Saturday's Guardian, wrote an article called, This Glorious Failure Could Yet Be Scotland's Finest Hour. 
and he analyzes what happened, I think, succinctly and brilliantly. He's the author of The Train Spotters, um, Train Spotting, by the way, um, if you want to reference him in, in context. And what happened in Scotland was extraordinary because big media, every, every newspaper in the United Kingdom, including Scotland, except for the Sunday Herald, opposed Scottish independence. Big business, the banks, the supermarkets, the financial institutions, all threatened to leave Scotland or to increase prices if there was a vote for independence. Big politics, all the major UK parties united to oppose Scottish independence. The Labour Party stood shoulder to shoulder with the Conservative Party, shoulder to shoulder to oppose the independence movement. And Big Museum opposed Scottish independence as well. There was a movement from the Tate, the British Museum, to try and use the weight of the national museums in London to put pressure in Scotland against independence as well. That only didn't happen because those of us who were in Wales and Scotland among the national museums protested at this and said this should not be done in the name of the national museums. Our masters, in other words, united, the establishment in London united to try to make sure that this didn't happen. Nevertheless, 45% of the population nearly, despite having nothing on their side in terms of the establishment anywhere, voted against it. And what had begun as a narrower nationalist sentiment, and I th we're all aware of the risks of nationalism, actually became, that became only a tiny part of what was a much larger movement of political, ecological, community activities that in a sense was a cry for freedom from the neoliberal economic model that has been applied so ruthlessly. I have to say, by all parties, really, for the last 30 years, with escalating consequences in the United Kingdom. And that has really captured our political process, that has undermined our democracy, that has meant that people no longer really have a place to vote that can represent their interests. And the Scottish de independence vote revealed all this with shaming clarity. Where were the museums? I'm asking this in full awareness that my museum and others were under strict instructions not to involve ourselves in political issues. Um, and that is, in some senses, a very proper position to take. But it does, it does raise questions, again, that I asked at the beginning. What culture is important? What ways of learning? In fact, the most amazing learning and the most fantastic cultural um, effervescence came from the Yes campaigners on the streets, being active out on the streets, being everywhere from their own volition. Nobody encouraged them to do this, really. Certainly nothing from the establishment. There was no reward for it. How does that, the most amazing democratic, political, seismic um, shift, relate to what museums do? We say we are for society. We say we are about society. Where were we? Where were we for those people? When they were learning, when they were being activists, when they were finding strength within them, where were we? In the closing chapter of Animal Farm, the animals look through the windows of the old farmhouse and they see humans becoming pigs and pigs becoming humans. It's assumed that this is a satire on Soviet communism. It could be a satire of any establishment that has betrayed its own people. It could be a satire of neoliberal capitalism. Behind us are the millions whose voices are unheard. Before us are the millions yet to be born, whose lives will be enriched or impoverished by the decisions we make in our generation. We often assume that we are the good 
in society, that beautiful or creatively imagined or culturally different objects are a social good. And therefore that we ourselves, our work, us as educators, us as curators, us as directors, is a social good too. Is it true? Once we lived in an age of gold, then we lived in an age of silver, and now we live in an age of rust. What will we be in future? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I want to ask you about your role in, at, at your museum. Mm -hmm. uh, I was involved in a day uh, in Sweden uh, that evolved around what will the learning be in the future in museums. And one thing that came out was educators will be much more involved in the leading of museums. And you are an educator mm -hmm. leading a museum. How does that reflect in what you present to us in your vision and how you make mm -hmm. this transformation? Okay. I have made a, a lot of changes at the museum. I've changed the department, which was the education department, from being a schools department to being for lifelong learning. So have restructured so that that's the case. Have given the learning exhibitions and new media department responsibility for exhibition design. All the new galleries in the St. Fagans development project, for example, are now very much a collaboration between curators and educators, interpreters, with a learning purpose behind it. I have to say that some of the curators at National Museum Wales are absolutely fantastic. I would mention, for instance, Beth Thomas, who's the keeper of history and archaeology, who is often a better educator than I was, um, and who comes from a deeply rooted belief that history must come from the public from the people. And so some of those boundaries between curatorial work and learning, I hope we are breaking down. And we are revisioning for the museum with the major question of what museum, what national museum do the people of Wales need as the guiding question for our future. We haven't completed that process yet, mm. but we're on that journey as well. So those are yeah, two yes. things. Fantastic. I, I, I want to ask you also, in the line of that, because uh, you are uh, reflecting now, and you have also done that in, in other previous work, how, how can we be relevant? <laughs> and what do we need from each other uh, in form of collaboration and from the facilitators of our operations in order to, be, to ask that question and be relevant? Uh, yeah, it's a really small a, question, but we I have know, until question, three, yeah. so... Yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose one of the reasons why I, s I started by saying I don't believe in most museums, don't believe in museums, other than by exception. In a sense, I think I could turn the question the other way around, really, and say, prove me wrong. How would you prove me wrong? What's, what justification can one give for museums and therefore within that the learning role of museums um, amidst the societies that we have? Now I do realize that Sweden is not the United Kingdom and I speak with passion out of the experience of the United Kingdom. But nevertheless I think that Neil Postman's question from 1989 remains relevant. It's a question that only your society can answer for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it won't be the same answer as we would give in our grotesquely distorting neoliberal world that we're creating in Britain. Mm. You, have, you, have, you mentioned uh, breaking the, uh, down the barriers between education and curatorship mm -hmm. in your institution uh, and creating dialogue within the institution in new ways. What dialogues are you engaging in or do you envision that will help you where you are uh, to keep on asking this question? The dialogues around purpose, mm. I think for me, are the hardest ones really to answer. Partly because I think they're probably not asked often enough. 
and therefore it's hard to look for many models elsewhere, but also because each culture is different. I think clarity of purpose, clarity of what we're trying to achieve is necessary. And given that museum cultures, actually there isn't such a thing as museum culture, there's a variety of subcultures which have emerged and become very strong and independent of each other very often. Um, getting getting a, a commonality of purpose across these different cultures, I think is also very difficult, a big challenge there. Mm. So I would love to hear of models and examples from Sweden or elsewhere, mm. where that clarity of social purpose, of social role, of honestly being able to put hand on heart and justify why we have public funding when there are so many other ways in which it could be spent. Show me, please. And I think there is some evidence, but show me, please, on that. Thank you, David. Good. Two things before we break for lunch and you can think about examples, and you can think about questions, because there will be time for questions later from all of us. More questions. This looks like stealing, but it's not. I just want to say that. <laughs> this was on your shares, and uh, it was very interesting, because uh, last week I went to a workshop by Fuism, who is here today, which is the organization for the museum educators. It was a great workshop, and they had about the same thing <laughs> uh, in that workshop, uh, where we produced uh, fantastic ideas around uh, future pro projects. Uh, this uh, is a little inquiry. It just says, my name is, I work with, I have, I need. And my suggestion is that you use this today. But I will leave it to you how you do that. You can either spot someone and decide that I'm going to give that mine to this person because I have a sense that it's the right one. Or you can just leave them at one of those two tables and get surprised by who is sending you the email or giving you the phone call. So don't forget to put some kind of contact here. I want to end this uh, rich uh, time with our guests with a quote from A Commonwealth where David quotes T.S. Eliot. I thought we could bring it with us during lunch. Where he says, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? And I think that uh, we will come back to what is knowledge and information uh, and how do we play with that in our institutions this afternoon.